left-hand corner. It should, you know, make sure. Welcome to the Society for American Soccer History's SASH session with David France and Tony Sampson, two Evertonians in North America. I'm Tom McCabe, SASH president, and today's co-organizer, Patrick Sullivan, and I uh, have been calling today's session Coffee with Toffees, uh, but that depends on where you are in the world and uh, what your coffee habits are. But uh, regardless, welcome to today's session. We're really looking forward to it. This is our second virtual session of the month. The first being with Jorn Buckholtz, the executive director of the National Soccer Hall of Fame in Frisco, Texas. Founded in 1993, SASH works to promote, facilitate, and disseminate research into the rich history and heritage in the United States of soccer. You can find us best in two places, on the web at ussoccerhistory.org and on social media with our Facebook and Twitter accounts. If you'd like to join the society, which is a great value at $20 a year, or renew your membership, please visit our website. You can do so through the Join SASH tab. Society members know all too well that soccer in the United States has a long, long history. And of course, it has some interesting links with Britain. Today, we're happy to present another chapter in that centuries-old transatlantic story, Everton in North America. We'll kick off the session with author, football historian, philanthropist, David France. Then society board member, Patrick Sullivan, will introduce our second guest, Tony Sampson, who will discuss Everton's relationship with North America today. Then we'll conclude with a question and answer period and finish well in advance of Toffee's match today at Goodison Park. Uh, when we get to the Q&A, uh, there's a way to you raise your hand or you can leave a, a question uh, in uh, the chat room or just speak up and uh, we'll make sure we get uh, your, your question heard. So please let me uh, introduce uh, David France. During his early life on Merseyside, in the past 44 years in North America, David has been infatuated with Everton Football Club. So much so that he has traveled over 2 million miles to not only support the club, but also introduce several trailblazing initiatives. In addition to writing a small library of Everton books, he created the Hall of Fame, established the Heritage Society, registered the former Players Foundation, and scoured the globe to assemble the celebrated Everton collection. Lauded as Dr. Everton, David is the life president of the Everton Football Club Shareholders Association. In 2011, Liverpool's Freedom of City panel conferred him the prestigious title of Citizen of Honor for Services for Football in Liverpool, the first to receive the honor since Bill Shankly. The next year he's awarded an OBE, Order of the British Empire, for his services to football in the United Kingdom and Europe. Please welcome David France. Thank you for that eloquent uh, introduction. I think I'll quit while I'm ahead. Um, I have to start with a confession. I'm British by birth, American by choice, and an Evertonian by the grace of the football gods. Um, I've lived, as you mentioned, I've lived here for 44 years and become increasingly aware of the contributions of Everton Football Club to North American soccer. Um, the object of this book, Toffee Soccer, as you can see on the screen, is to aid Everton's imminent initiatives to raise its profile in both Canada and the United States. Um, I must warn you uh, that, uh, uh, that what I tell you is going to be propaganda. Um, Everton has been a sleeping giant for 30 years, and it woke up five years ago to find that the rest, that its world has changed. Um, credit must be given to my co-authors. Uh, they are lifelong Evertonians. Uh, I'm a fifth generation Evertonian, and they are as well. Rob Sawyer, is, uh, his great grandfather was the chairman of the club just after the First World War. And Darren Griffiths, who is the voice of Everton, um, is the, also the editor of the club's programme. Uh, the book um, is, um, 
has three c- components. And I'll start with the games that Everton have played in North America. Um, Everton have played, have toured North America on 10 occasions and played 35 games, competitive games. That's more than any other English club. There may be the odd Scottish club that may be able to rival that, such as Hearts and Aberdeen. Um, While it first visited South America in 1909, it didn't show up in North America until 1956. At that time, the club or the team was composed of local players and a few Irish guys. I always say it was a panascal sprinkled with a few shamrocks. <laughs> and um, they played at that time, they came over by boat and they played in the soccer hotspots of, of that era. Uh, Chicago, they played select teams such in Chicago, New York, New Jersey, uh, New England and St. Louis. Um, the, uh, it, all the games were one-sided, um, small crowds, but it was a very successful tour, if not something of a culture shock. Um, I, the, the players who were on that tour that I talked to, they were all impressed by the big American cars, televisions, of course, which weren't available in the United States at that time. And the fact, and, and think more than anything, the food, because Britain has just come out of rationing in, in 1956. I think a lot of them went home with crew cuts and were in blue jeans. So they were impressed by what uh, by the American lifestyle. Uh, Everton showed up again five years later in 1956 in the International Soccer League, which was the brainchild of Bill Cox, who I think was the president of the Philadelphia Phillies. Um, It was, uh, whilst American soccer hadn't changed in those five years, Everton had. It had uh, attracted the input of uh, Sir John Moores, who was the head of the Littlewoods organization. And Littlewoods at that time ran the national football pools. They had department stores in uh, in all the major towns and they had a big mail order business. Uh, I would say that it was something like Sears Roadbook with a touch of of, uh, Las Vegas associated with it. Uh, He um, was very ambitious. He, uh, his arrival coincided with the abolition of the maximum wage in England, but not in Scotland. So his funds attracted, I would say, most of the, or many of the best players north of the border. They came down to Everton. So at one point, Everton had about six or eight uh, Scottish players in the squad. Um, they, uh, they were known as the Merseyside Millionaires, and they took part in this competition Uh, the International Soccer League, which was in two sections, eight teams in each section. Everton were in section one and they played postseason in June, uh, May and June. Um, They played against two North American teams, four teams from Europe and one, and Bangu, who were from Brazil. Uh, It was a very cool physical competition. Um, The... um, I think it, it uh, I would say that uh, the outcome was that I think the opponents uh, realized not to pick a fight with a team that has more than one Scottish player in it. And uh, uh, for example, in one game, two were sent off. In another game, two were sent off and one was carried off with a broken leg. Um, Everton won the section and came back uh, in August to play the winners of the second section, which was Duke La Prague. And Duke La Prague, as I'm sure many of you know, was essentially the Czechoslovakian national team who a year later lost the final of the World Cup to Pele and Brazil. Uh, Everton were beaten in both games, 7-2 and 2-0. And John Moores was very disappointed uh, because I think at that time he thought that British football ruled the world. Uh, But more important, he was appalled by the organisation of the event, the accommodations, the the scheduling of the fixtures and the fact that the team had to train on a baseball field in Central Park. Uh, John Moores vowed he would never return or that the club would never return. And they didn't until 1985. And that was when they went to Toronto to take part in the Molson Cup. Um, At that time, Canada was close to qualifying for the World Cup, um, 
but they didn't have anyone to play. They, there wasn't a national league either in the uh, in Canada or, or in the United States, and the players needed to, some competitive practice. Um, they, they formed two teams in ex Toronto and also the Canadian national team, and they uh, they invited Everton to come and play exhibition games. It was quite convenient for Everton because they'd been banned like all other English teams. They'd been banned from Europe, so they didn't have anybody to play in there through no fault of our own, I should add. Um, so they, uh, they didn't have anybody else to play. So they, they showed up in Toronto, they played two games. It was a great success. Um, and then in 2004, Everton under David Moyes uh, accepted an invitation to participate in the Tejas Cup in Houston, where they played two Mexican teams, uh, at Pachuca and the Club America. Uh, Moyes was really impressed with the bonding that went on amongst his team, but more than anything, he was impressed by the NFL training facilities that, that the club used while they were there. And in fact, he replicated those facilities at Finch Farm, Everton's training ground, and he also uh, recruited a bunch of American conditioning experts uh, to work on his own team. Uh, David Myers, or David was in love with the United States. He brought the team back six, six more times, and uh, one of those was for the, uh, in 2009 for the MLS All-Star Game. His final visit was in uh, 2013 when Everton played in the International uh, Champions Challenge Cup uh, against uh, the beat Juventus and they lost to Real Madrid. Um, <clears throat> on the other side, Everton have hosted uh, two North American sides. In 1891, a team called the Canadians visited, uh, toured the United Kingdom. Uh, they played a whole bunch of fixtures, but the highlight of the tour was to play the English champions at that time, it was Everton. And, and then, say, 10 years ago, Robert Washika, who was an old Everton player, or former Everton player, he brought over the Columbus crew team who played Everton behind closed doors. Um, I have to say that the book reviews all these games in detail, and more important, it has inputs from many of the participants. So if I may, I'll move on to the, uh, the players. And I'm going to overwhelm you now with names of people who I hope some of you uh, recognize. Um, Everton have been associated, ev the men associated with Everton, uh, have been involved with uh, 180 North American teams, 180, and they've also co coached 60 North American teams. If we go back to the early days, um, the biggest name to come from England over to the United States was Sam Chedzoy. He was England's star winger at that time. He, he moved over in 1926. It was shortly after he'd found a loophole in the corner kick uh, rule, and which caused some controversy. Uh, in addition to Sam, around the time of the uh, First World War, there was uh, about six or so uh, Everton players came over. It was convenient for them to do so because of the maritime links between Liverpool and Boston and Liverpool and New York. Uh, the earliest one was a guy called Herbert Edwards, who showed up in 1894, and he played for the Boston Beanie Eaters, which I think is a wonderful name for a football club. And then, um, but before that, we had... A, an American on the, who was a vice president of the club. In 1887, we had a Dr. Powell, William Powell, who was a vice president and he was also the club's medical advisor. He was the first American, but more interestingly, he was the first African American to be involved with, with Everton. Let me move on quickly from those days to the NASL. As you know, that ran from 68 to 84. Uh, during that time, waves of uh, both seasoned English players, British players came over to play for American teams. And uh, 
also some younger players who didn't quite make it in the football league. They came over as well. So there were people at both ends of their careers. Uh, and when it comes to the established players, <clears throat> excuse me, I'll just read out, I'll tell you the names because I'm very familiar with them. We had Al, the great Alan Ball, who was in Philadelphia. He was also in Vancouver with uh, Roger Kenyon. We had Jimmy Gabriel, who uh, I think is Mr. Soccer in Seattle. He was there with uh, uh, Bruce Rioch. And down in uh, San Francisco, we had um, Brian Quinn, who was... <clears throat> I think he won the indoor title six times before he was capped by the United States playing outdoors. We had um, Tony McLaughlin, who was uh, with Dallas. He was, Dallas won the first NASL championship and Tony was the top scorer. And then we had the Playboys in Florida, uh, mm -hmm. were the, uh, in Fort Lauderdale, where there was Gert Mueller and the famous George Best. And we had, and who I think they spent more time judging wet t-shirt competitions than actually playing football. And uh, we had um, Asa Hartford and uh, Gary Jones, Gary Stanley, and um, oh, name escapes me. Uh, there, there was another one there. And then we've got um, Jimmy Husband in Memphis. We've got uh, the magical uh, Duncan McKenzie up in Tulsa. <clears throat> and in New York, of course, we had Dave Clements, who played for the Cosmos alongside Pele and Beckenbauer. And of course, that team was also managed by a former Everton player in Ken Furphy. And then last, uh, that I always like to include, because he's one of my favourites, is Steve Sargent, who was up in Detroit and still is there. The younger players who came over, uh, as I said, they, they hadn't made it in through the youth programme at Everton, so they never actually played for the first team. But they were just as important because many of them took uh, athletic scholarships and studied at American universities and stayed along to coach. And uh, I'd just like to mention their names. We, we've got Lee Cowlishaw, who was in Richmond. I think he spent 30-odd years with the Richmond Kickers. We had uh, Brian Monaghan down in Texas. Uh, Colin, uh, Brian Harvey, who is Colin Harvey, who is Colin Harvey is an Everton icon. Uh, Colin Harvey, uh, that's his brother, and he was in Oklahoma. And then we've got Tommy Wielden up in, uh, in Calgary. And actually his son still, his son is currently the manager of the Calgary Storm. Uh, <clears throat> moving on to the MLS era, I'm just reading out the names here. Mo Johnson, Paul Rideout, Robert Wasika, John Spencer, Anders Limpar, Abel Xavier, who played with what's his name in the in Los Angeles, <clears throat> and of course Tim Tim Cahill up in New York, and our Wayne, who played in Washington D.C. And of course that's Wayne Rooney. And uh, when it comes to coaches, we had Chris Woods, who was the, co the goalkeeping coach of the U.S. national team. We have Adrian Heath, who was up in Minnesota. We've got uh, Adam Smith, who was over in Sacramento. Preki, who I think is still up in Seattle. And of course, Phil Neville, who is now um, managing what's his name's team in Miami. <laughs> I have to tell you a story about uh, David Beckham because um, the, the guy who's the editor of the uh, Liverpool Echo, the local newspaper, called me one day with the rumour uh, that he expected some kind of confirmation of that David Moyes had a, approached David Beckham uh, about joining Everton for a year or so. I think it was through Nip, Phil Neville. And I was actually horrified. And I actually turned to the Weather Channel to see if hell had frozen, has frozen over because I just can't imagine David Beckham in an Everton shirt. Uh, I should also add that up in Canada, we have, when it comes to women's soccer, we have Bev Priestman, who is the current manager of the Canadian women's team. Now, when it comes to the other direction, the impact of American, North Americans on Everton Football Club. Uh, there's been 15 representatives have shown up. I think we're, we're all familiar with the, 
uh, you know, the, the names that are familiar to us, which is like Brian McBride, um, Joe Maxmore, um, Precky, and but there's also Greg Burhalter, as you mentioned before, and Greg came over, uh, had trials with Everton, and it didn't work out. Unlike Bruce Wilson, the uh, Canadian icon, who came over, had very impressive trials. Both of them played for the Everton second team in the Central League in competitive games. And Bruce was offered a contract, but I think his wife preferred to stay in Canada or in North America. And, and of course, I think Bruce has got played more games in the NASL uh, than anybody else. Uh, I'm sure you'll correct me on that. When it comes to Everton in being recognised in North America, of course, we have 10 members in the different halls of fame. And I also like to add uh, that we also have Dick Howard, who I'm going to coordinate into that group that makes 11, because I know that Dick is in there as well. The book itself profiles 135 men and 15 women. Uh, we've interviewed 80 people and the uh, experiences of playing in North America are well documented. And I think people will find them, if not amusing, interesting. Let me go on to the third component, which I think is the most important part of any football club, and that's the fans. Um, <clears throat> When I was uh, first, my first 15 years in, in, uh, in North America, I was in Houston and, uh, and I often bumped into Evertonians, people from Liverpool. You remember that time, Margaret Thatcher had uh, instigated the, uh, what did she call it, the managed uh, decline of the city. And, people, and there was high unemployment in the city and, and the residents moved off to Australia, New Zealand, Canada, and obviously uh, Europe and also North America. And it was often that I would bump into them. And more often than not, they were Evertonians. And, uh, but things have changed in the last 30 years as well, you know, uh, with the introduction of the MLS and the EPL, uh, we now have Everton fans who are much younger uh, than, uh, than what I'd met previously. And therefore, we can no longer boast ever and have a saying that we were born, not manufactured. We were, we were not, <coughs> we did not choose, we were chosen. Uh, I think that has to change now because these younger fans actually choose Everton for one reason or another. And what we did in the book, we surveyed a hundred of them to find out why they actually selected Everton as the club. And uh, there were three, I'll give you the, there some bizarre reasons, I can assure you, but I'll give you the, the three top reasons uh, why they do so. The first one is the club's values. Uh, I don't wish to offend anybody here, but Everton have never brought shame to the ship, to the city of its birth. Um, it's also, its work in its local community has, is outstanding. You know, um, it's the, the, the neighbouring districts to, to Goodison Park, Walton and Kirkdale are some of the poorest, some of the most disadvantaged in Britain and also in Europe with high unemployment. Uh, I think it's 60% of the children live in poverty and all the problems of crime that go with that. With that. Uh, Everton have reached out to embrace the community. They've built a school and they've built senior citizen centers. They've, they've, uh, they've built meeting halls for the locals to, uh, to, to meet in. And also they're in the process of building a state-of-the-art mental health facility. Uh, I think it's, it's work that I can just say in the last year, They've supported 30,000 families uh, with food, with utilities, with medical support, mental health support. That is consistent with uh, the formation of the former Players Foundation, where no club, I think, in the world, I'm going to say, treats, it, looks after its former players in the way that Everton does. Uh, 20 years ago, we formed the Former Players Foundation to, uh, to look after the players who played in the 1950s, the 60s and the 70s. These were guys who just 
earned a little bit more than an average wage, but they had the battle wounds that went along with playing football as a career. And therefore, during the, a certain period of time, we uh, we paid for 50 hip replacements, 50 knee operations, et cetera, so that, the, that at least their lives can be pain-free. We made so much progress that UEFA embraced our um initiative and it became the UEFA model and other clubs took it on and uh, this all the way through Europe uh, but you know obviously the, the bigger ones such as Real Madrid, Barcelona and Bayern Munich, Glasgow Rangers they uh, uh, certainly embraced it and Barcelona went even farther because they uh, they they levied attacks on their players I'm not sure given their current financial situation if that's the case but they levied a tax of uh, 1% on the wages of all the first team squad. Half of that went to community initiatives. The other half went to looking after their former players. So I think we set a good example. When it comes to the second reason, that's history. And I'm going to bore you with this now because I know this off by heart. Everton have played 118 seasons in the top flight of English football. They are the pillar of English football. Um, in comparison, Manchester United have played 22 seasons less. City have played 26 seasons less. Um, um, Chelsea, 32 seasons less. Tottenham, 32 seasons less. Uh, the club is renowned for its, uh, its first, that's what it calls it, its trailblazing initiative. It was the first club to build a purpose-built football stadium, which, of course, is Anfield. And uh, it's also the first club to publish a programme. And it's the first club to buy a set of uh, uh, gold nets um, from the inventor, uh, John Brodie, who, of course, is an Everton fan and uh, the first club to wear 1 to 11 on its shirts, and the first club to appear on television. Um, if you want to learn more about Everton's history, I suggest you go to the website of the Everton Collection, which I think you, you'll find is, is uh, very, very impressive. It contains 20,000 items, and um, I'll just indicate to you what some of them look like. There is um, season tickets from Everton's days in Stanley Park in 1881. There's um, uh, player contracts from 1890, professional player contracts from 1890 when they were paid two guineas a game. There's the tender documents for the construction of the Anfield ground in 1886. There's medals dating back to 1890, and, but there's one for every competition that Everton has won and also came runners-up. There are the rules for training from 1895. There's letters of correspondence, particularly one from William McGregor, who was the founder of the Football League with Aston Villa in 1888, asking Everton to play. They never played Villa before. And, uh, and then there are the programmes. Uh, the programmes, a uh, continuous... Uh, a run of home programs for 120 years, away programs for 90 years. But more, the oldest program is 1885, and there are complete volumes. That is 50 volumes, per pro, in 50 program per volume for the seasons in 1887 and 8, 1888, 9, and 89, 90. The reason why I'm telling you this is that they are the first pieces of memorabilia associated with the clubs that we, we know and love, such as uh, Newton Heath, Manchester United, Celtic, Glasgow Rangers, and all the founding uh, uh, of all the founding members of the Football League. The, there's also the home programme from the game that you mentioned earlier, Tom, of uh, the visit to Little Lever. The... Uh, you may not know that between 1904 and 1935, Everton and Liverpool collaborated on a programme uh, and uh, all of those are in the collection and they tell essentially the, the development of football in Liverpool as well as the, development, the social history of Liverpool. Um, now, what is the top reason why people support Everton or pick Everton to support them? 
Well, you'll be maybe not surprised to know that they uh, they all responded because Everton is not Liverpool and it's not Manchester United and it certainly is not Manchester City or Chelsea. Everton, in their eyes, is a proper football club. It's one that it wins, it loses, and that's why we we support the clubs. If you want to win things, if you want your team to win every week, then Manchester, then Everton isn't the team for you. Maybe you should support Manchester United or Manchester City, or why not both of them? Um, it's uh, Everton. Evertonians have tremendous bonds within the, the fan base. Actually, they make. Uh, um, uh, more biological families uh, put they put more biological families to shame um, the um, I, I think I can I can best sum that up by the, the words of the great Alan Ball who was a good friend of mine and uh, who came from Bolton and uh, Alan said once Everton has touched you your life will never ever be the same and I think that's true if I could just sum up now and say that, summarize and say, uh, the book's called Toffee Soccer. It's published by the Cooperton Books. Uh, it's a big one. It's 568 pages. It's in color. It's uh, uh, generously illustrated. It weighs four pounds. So after you've read it, I'm sure you could use it for something else. Uh, it's a limited edition of... 1878, and uh, to order it, it's best to go on to the the Cooperton Books website. Uh, the release date is the uh, the tenth of June. I'm done. Thank you very much. Uh, really enjoyed that, and we're gonna pass it on to Patrick. And I believe uh, Zach will uh, pass over uh, the screen to Tony so he can throw some slides up. So uh, we'll let Patrick continue with the introduction. All right, well, thank you. So uh, after learning about the long and deep history of Everton Football Club in North America, it is my honor to introduce our next guest who plays a large role in not only maintaining that relationship but helping to make it thrive. Tony Sampson is a native Scouser who moved to Chicago with his family three years ago. Born and bred in Evertonian, he remains a season ticket holder. An active member of the Chicago Evertonian Supporters Group, Tony was elected by Everton supporters in 2020 to be one of the first international representatives on the EFC Fans Forum, which is the official independent group that represents the voice of Evertonians. He leads the international working group for the forum where his work is focused on providing a link between EFC and Everton supporter, supporters overseas. Tony also coordinates the North American EFC Supporter Club Network, a group of over 40 EFC supporters groups, leads who meet monthly to share ideas, thoughts, and projects on building Everton's presence across North America. So without further ado, please welcome Mr. Tony Sampson. Thanks, Patrick. Um, I feel, Just to say, to, to follow somebody like, uh, like David France and everything that he's contributed to to Everton is is uh, is is slightly nerve wracking if I'm completely honest with you, and I, I must admit I feel like um, maybe Tim Howard's understudy must have felt when when Tim said he was retiring and moving on. It's a very daunting task. So listen, it's a it's a great pleasure to to be here today and also to to, to follow David. Just a couple of things, I, a few remarks I, I've been asked to make uh, over the course of the next maybe five to ten minutes is maybe just reflect on where does where does Everton go from here? David has talked in great detail around the great history that we've got with, with North America and how far that goes back and the very fact that no other club has visited North America more than Everton. But I guess some of my comments will just reflect a little bit on sort of how has the supporter network grown uh, and sort of what might be next for that supporter network as it is becoming one of the sort of best connected uh, and most um, ambitious and I would say sort of ever increasing and growing fan base right across North America and something that that uh, it wasn't until I arrived here three years ago as an Evertonian searching for somewhere to make sure I could get my Everton fix on a weekly basis I, I really appreciated until I was actually out, actually out here. Before I maybe reflect on that and how it all began uh, and sort of mention some of the people that have been fundamental in sort of building this network and talk a little bit about 
uh, sort of what the club's aspirations are are now. Just a little word on the Everton Fans Forum that Patrick mentioned there. So this is a, a group of um, currently 12 Evertonians. It's independent of the football club. Um, and its members are elected by the Everton supporters uh, and fan base uh, on an annual basis. Uh, the term is normally for, for three years. And the idea here was to ensure that Evertonians could have uh, a place to go to uh, and have a say on issues that, that they felt were important to them and also create and make sure that there was a, a dialogue between them and the club on, on some of the key issues. Uh, we meet very regularly with uh, various officials within Everton Football Club. Uh, we meet on a monthly basis with them and have a series of sort of focus areas and priorities. One of those, uh, as Patrick mentioned, is our international group. So. Um, for the first time, actually, uh, the forum now uh, has overseas representatives to give um, Evertonians, wherever they may be in the world, uh, a voice on, on, on club issues and, and, and to, to really leverage that. David talked about sort of the, the pride in which sort of Everton has, uh, has got within its sort of community and many of the slogans that it's sort of carried over the years around the fact that we're born and not manufactured. But I think there's a very clear recognition now that with the changing nature of football and increasing globalisation, Everton uh, may have to play a little bit of catch up against some of its uh, some of its competitors and, and, and neighbouring clubs in sort of sort of extending that reach, um, you know, beyond uh, the, the the boundaries of of Liverpool, the Liverpool Four postcode. So um, that's the sort of the work of the forum. We've begun to sort of really try and sort of get a little bit more insight into what are you know what is it like to be an Evertonian uh, in North America. Uh, you know, it is a very different experience to those that are sort of in the city of Liverpool or, or or even in the UK and can travel to the game. So we kicked off a piece of work uh, last year to to really sort of understand what those. Uh, issues are and what, what what it meant to be an Evertonian and also what were the things that Evertonians living overseas and, and in North America um, you know, wanted us to sort of drive forward and you'll see from this slide that sort of you know building that engagement and to use David's phrase sort of uh, ensuring that the supporters have got that propaganda and that propaganda machine is working in full flow was one of those issues so we've been working with the club very closely on that secondly was more around brand uh, and retail visibility. It's not always been easy to uh, to sort of buy Everton merchandise in North America. So this has been a, a big issue that, that, that's been carried over for many years. So again, working with the club, we're trying to improve that. And then the final one that actually came through and um, I think also relates to something that David said when he was talking about the values of the club uh, was actually the work and the pride um, that Evertonians feel in how much Everton is part of the local community in Liverpool and how much it gives back there. And what's been amazing, certainly since I've been out here, is to see um, the many of the supporters clubs, even in the US, um, giving back within their own communities as part of this approach. And in some cases, actually raising thousands and thousands of dollars to not just to their local communities, but also back to Evan in the community. So uh, a very real issue there. And just, I think, goes to show sort of how that, that reasoning and that sort of value set of being an Evertonian sort of reaches beyond the boundaries of the city itself. A quick word on sort of how sort of the, the network all began. Um, it was actually um, somebody that I'm sort of now friends with in, in as part of the Chicago Evertonians group, uh, who actually was visiting Liverpool. She's a, she's a Chicagoan. Uh, but she was visiting Liverpool uh, in, in 2000, 2001 as part of a business studies uh, course that she was doing at Liverpool University that was led by the, by the then, unfortunately, Liverpool supporter, Rogan Taylor. And having spent time in the city, um, she, unfortunately, her first football experience was to actually go and watch the other team that we don't speak about. Uh, David didn't mention their name either. Um, but the way that she describes her experiences of being at that other ground where the, the actual language she uses with were words like um, hollow, empty, contrived. Uh, and she also, as every true Evertonian, declared her absolute hatred for the song that the uh, that the other team sings on a, on a regular basis. So, very clearly, she you know she was she she realised that that the other team was not the team for her. And once she'd set foot in Goodison, that was the the, the turning moment for her. And she describes not just the game, which actually that Everton got beat that day, but actually the experience after the game in the pubs and the bars close to Goodison Park, where, you know, she formed a strong bond with many people that she's still in touch with today. 
On her return to Chicago, um, Diana was sort of in her local bar and saw an Everton plaque and sign in the corner of uh, a bar called Ginger's. Um, and on inquiring who uh, whose that was, she realised that actually the bar owner was another Evertonian um, who was sort of trying to look and trying to find uh, other, other Everton supporters in and around. And they came up with the idea of starting what, they de what they've defined as the, the first sort of supporters club, uh, which became known as EFC North America which had 17 members from different sort of parts of, uh, of, 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 of the U S uh, and has it's become to grow. Um, so that was the sort of the, that was the sort of the start of it all. I think it's important to mention as well that people like David Kurtz, Marshall Lamb uh, then played a significant role in, in, in extending that network. So I don't think there's a city or a state now where there isn't an Everton supporters club presence or certainly a, an Everton, an Everton supporter. And I think that the work that David, and Marshall have done over the last number of years to, to build this network. It deserves some special mention on that. In terms of where it's got to today, um, there are now over 50 officially affiliated and non-officially affiliated, sorry, non-official uh, supporters groups right across North America. Uh, and what the network has been doing, again, building on the work that, that others have done over a number of years is to try and just strengthen and build on that connection between the groups to, 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 to put a little bit additional sort of structure and, and, and also make sure that now through the fans forum that they can have their voice heard on a, on a series of issues. Um, it sounds a little bit formal this, but, you know, it's our love of Everton that brings us all together. But, you know, we're now meeting on a regular basis. Uh, you know, we coordinate feedback on key issues. Uh, the North American Supporters Clubs, for example, wrote to the Liverpool City Council as it was considering the planning application for Everton's new stadium uh, and wanted to make sure that the North American supporters could have their voice heard on that and, 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 and uh, their support for the, for the stadium. Uh, it's also involved in, you know, an official consultation now that the club is holding with the fans forum on the fallout of the European Super League proposals that sort of rocked um, sort of the football world recently. But again, uh, just an indication as to how, um, you know, that feedback and that network is now sort of actively involved in, you know, many of the, the issues affecting not just Everton, but also football. Um, it's also been sort of the, the home for developing a number of supporter-led projects. You know, David talked about those three things at the end and the, the, the emphasis around sort of Everton, its supporters and its supporters community. And what's been really pleasing now is, is that this community is actually developing specific programmes to take to the club and to some of the club's partners so that it can further build on the network, build the awareness and to, and to David's point, um, make sure that we can convert as many people into Evertonians if, if, if they're not already. Um, that included a, a sort of another first, another Everton first, which was a hookup with Everton's official merchandise partner, Hummel. Uh, who produce uh, Everton's kits so that there's now 40 groups um, that are part of a collaboration whereby um, people in every supporters club can get official Hummel Everton mer merchandise with their own supporters club uh, logo on there. I'm wearing the Chicago Evertonians one now before I head off to, the, to watch the game a little bit later. But also, again, critically linking back to that community sort of spirit as well as is that we agreed with Hummel and, and, and Soccer.com, the partners, that a proportion of those sales will actually be reinvested back into Everton in the community. So, you know, we can feel and play a part in, in supporting that as well. And then the other thing to mention briefly was um, was actually um, an event, a digital event that was hosted by the club recently called Everton USA Live, which um, was uh, the first time that the that, that supporters, uh, well, not the first time they've come together because there's been many through through uh, the Premier League USA, but um, was a, a digital event to bring Everton supporters right across North America, which we hope will be uh, the start of something that will create a permanent platform now. And, and once the pandemic is out of the way, hopefully we'll see this uh, where Evertonians can come together in person and celebrate the club and everything about it. Um, just a little word on maybe sort of where this goes from the future, uh, from, from here. Um, the club has embarked on uh, defining a, an international strategy of which it's been very clear that North America is the priority focus for growth. Um, they have appointed Jürgen Meinke and his organisation Pulse Sports. Uh, Jürgen was one of the early um, 
members of um, of David Beckham's team into Miami and sort of grew that concept in the club. Uh, and he's now been appointed by the club to help them with their sort of strategic sort of um, pro, um, growth process within within the club, focusing on a number of different areas, um, some of which will be will be of no surprise. But the one of which I'm particularly interested in is obviously that fan engagement one and how the club can grow, work with, collaborate uh, and sort of help extend uh, the supporters club network out here in the USA. Uh, I think there's been many comments that you know, it might be a little bit, um, there's been opportunities missed in the past, but I think this is an important time now for us to focus on the future. And I'm, I'm looking forward to how this can, can build even further and also make sure that the next Toffee Soccer book uh, maybe includes some of the work that we've been doing today as well. So uh, a little bit more of a current uh, sort of update on on Everton and how it engages with North America and a little bit still to be seen in terms of how it evolves. But uh, thank you very much for, for the time and give me the opportunity to share a little bit about that. I think you're on mute, Tom. I am not, I'm not often muted, right? Uh, but uh, thank you for that. Uh, really interesting to get the past, present, and future, you know, all in, in uh, one go here, even though we're a historical society. It's that interesting relationship between uh, the past and, and, in this case, the club's values and its history and, you know, what it's, you know, doing in the North American setting. So uh, I'd love to just open it up um, uh, to folks if they have any questions or comments and uh, we can do a little bit of the, the question and answer before we wrap up for today. And I will go first. Um, David, this David France Everton collection, uh, I, I'd love to, to know a little bit more uh, about <laughs> that in terms of when it got started, maybe some of the foundational artifacts, um, where it is now, maybe your best, you know, piece of memorabilia. You know, you mentioned a few things uh, in your discussion, but but I'd love to, you know, get a little more information on that. I'll be glad to. The um, it started when I when we lived in Houston. <clears throat> I was an executive from an oil company there, and uh, I would spend my Thursdays, uh, Thursday evenings were my Everton time. And uh, one day my mother sent over, she called me and she said that uh, she had uh, a box, a shoe box full of Everton items, I guess from my youth. And she wanted to know what to do with them. Should she throw them away or should she send them over? And of course, horrified at the thought of throwing them away, I asked to send them over and let us have a look at them. Well, of course, you know, I then had a week of living my childhood. You know, you only have to look at the program and you remember the game, you remember going to the game, you remember, you know, something, an incident about the game. But I didn't, I'm not a collector myself. <clears throat> so I contacted Everton about uh, if they would like to add my little shoebox to the archives. And they told me that they didn't have any archives and I was horrified. So I, I had a word with my wife and I decided, well, we were the people who were going to put this together. This was in the days before the internet and before Sotheby's and Christie's had got involved in uh, uh, sports memorabilia. So I uh, came over to, I used to come over to the UK on a regular basis and uh, I enlisted a troop of uh, agents and uh, advisors and um, uh, dealers who could uh, uh, acquire things for me. And I gave them a list to start with and then I soon disposed of that and I said, anything associated with Everton, I'll buy just you know just collect it just bring gather it up make sure it's in good condition and um, and send it to me and uh, that went on for about 15 years and the stuff that we uh, gathered was quite incredible you know what what actually we were getting were other people's lives we were getting their experiences ever as football fans so we're getting a little piece of everyone's life 
And of course, then there were significant items that I mentioned earlier, which go back to the beginning of uh, organized professional football. And <clears throat> an item I didn't mention, uh, I came across the club's original minute books. They're called the Everton Ledgers, the Everton Scriptures. And they detail <clears throat> the board of directors meetings or in the early days, the management committee meetings on a weekly basis. So every decision that the club made is in there. All the scouting reports are, are in there. All the negotiations for acquiring players, for paying players, for erecting the, the stadium, um, <clears throat> for choosing the colours. Everything is in there. And they date back to 1886. And the significance of that, of course, is that in 1888, the Football League was started. So they... <clears throat> document Everton's involvement in the beginning of football, or organised football, the Football League. <clears throat> and then if we go just uh, um, four years on, they also document the, uh, the dispute with John Holding, the landlord, who was the president of Everton, um, regarding the Anfield ground and uh, his, uh, his decision to kick Everton out of that ground and form his own football club. So, of course, Everton went to Goodison. That's well documented in the minutes, the building of a, of a, of a, a football ground within a, uh, within a summer. It was quite a significant challenge. Uh, but also he floated Liverpool Football Club, which at the time were called Everton Athletic. And all of that's in, in the, and, you know, there's the signing of Dixie Dean, there's the, the Tommy Long, everyone is in there. They go from 1886 up to uh, 1964. How they escape the clutches of the club, I don't know. Uh, and I don't really want to know. I'm just glad that we secured them and they're now back in, uh, in the Everton collection. The collection was transferred into public ownership about 12 years ago. It's currently in the records office in Liverpool. It's been on show uh, on two occasions. One was at Goodison Park, where we showed about 2% of it. And then at the Picton uh, Library in Liverpool, uh, we had a similar exhibition that ran for a couple of weeks. Uh, we're hoping that when, the new when we move to the new stadium on the banks of Mersey, that uh, it will play a, a, a key part of that because one of the most important parts of any football club is its heritage. Excellent. I love, uh, it goes from a shoebox to a full archive. Uh, amazing, amazing story. I believe uh, Gwyn Thompson has uh, raised a hand. So uh, please. You're on mute. If you could unmute yourself. Nice great. to meet you. Sorry about that. Nice to meet you. Nice to speak to you. I'm another one that Tony will tell you he can't keep quiet. Um, David, on the Everton Live event we had recently, uh, obviously you got on there, you've been speaking, you've been speaking with Tony. Are you planning on joining us for uh, Toffee Fest or any live meetups we're going to be able to do over here in the US, David? Because I think listening to these stories that, that you've got, I think a lot of, a lot of the blues would really sit down, relax in the armchair, sup on their beer and, and listen for hours and hours to what you've got to say. Yeah, I'd love to. Um, I, 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 let me make a shout out to, to Marshall Lamb and, and David Kurt. You know that a few years ago they had proposed a meet, a gathering of Everton fans, American, North American Everton fans, actually every Everton fan uh, in Las Vegas. Uh, I'd done a film on Alex Young, The Golden Vision, and uh, we had um, released it in, um, in Liverpool, in London, and the third uh, sh showing was going to be in Vegas for reasons that maybe we shouldn't discuss. That was cancelled, which was a great shame because it, I think Las Vegas um, is a great gathering point for people. And uh, so any Toffee Fest, I can assure you, I'll be there. Super news. Perfect. Mark Cranston uh, has uh, either raised his hand or, or uh, asked to, for a question in the chat room. Mark. Thank you, Tom. Um, first of all, I want to thank uh, Dave and Tony um, for what may well be a life-changing experience this morning. Um, 
I uh, had no idea what I was coming into. I just thought it would be an interesting chat. Now, for, for years and years, uh, I've been struggling uh, to find a Premier League team. Um, and, and, and the thing that's always held me back was that I, I, I felt that, um, th that I had to have a genuine connection to the team. Um, you know, I'm a, I'm a uh, Portland Timbers fan uh, because I lived in Portland for years. Um, I live in Las Vegas now, so, uh, you know, fan here. Um, but um, I always struggled to, uh, to, uh, to pick a team and feel like I could, uh, I, I, I could uh, truly be um, accepted by that, that, that fan group and, and, and as a, you know, a, a, for, for uh, uh, not having been there and, and just kind of having almost a manufactured fan uh, uh, fandom. So I, I uh, yesterday watching the FA Cup, I told my wife, I said, you know, I, I got to really think about this, uh, you know, picking a, a Premier League team. And uh, because it would be great every, you know, Saturday morning to go down with a group of people and watch a game. And, I, and I, what I've always uh, done is choose the team with the most Americans at the start of the season. Um, uh, just because I'm a big U.S. soccer fan. And so I always say that, uh, well, you know, the two teams I followed the most have been Everton and, and uh, Fulham over the years. And, um, and, and when I look at your list of uh, the three reasons that people choose a Premier League team, that, that just, you know, it, it screams that I should be an Everton fan. Um, you know, looking at, uh, uh, I, I actually have set myself a test. So, uh, so I already uh, join, or uh, asked to join the Facebook group for the uh, Las Vegas Evertonians. I uh, will purchase the book and go through that and see if I can can develop that loyalty. Um, but it it just I I th this may well be the the team. And you also reminded me that I actually went to the game in 2004 in uh, Houston. And I had, I had even forgotten that I was at that game. And so in some way, I, I can feel like, you know, well, I've attended Everton games since night. I think Mark has uh, frozen there uh, and, and we've lost him uh, for a bit. Can I, just else, say uh, that, have, can I just question, say that Marcus that. has sure. made my day? Uh, I consider myself to be a missionary, and uh, every <laughs> year I want to, a convert. Um, I'm working on a Mexican guy who lives up the road from me, but Marcus, I think you're the you're the one for the 2021. <laughs> and I have one question, sir. Then I'm sorry I, I got disconnected there for a second. And that is, I know the first thing I'm going to do and want to do, uh, uh, you know, when I choose the team, and that is to get every uh, person who's been capped by the uh, U.S. team and has played a first uh, team game for for the club uh, to get them to autograph a jersey. And so I've ran through right now, and I have Donovan McBride, Moore, Howard, and Precky. Um, it looks like Quinn, Robinson, and Hahnemann did not make it to the first team for, for uh, games. And is there a, a, a list of um, players from, from older eras that I should be looking for, or is that it's, probably it, the list? Yeah, it's all, it's all in the book. You, okay. you, you, you'll discover in the book. As I said, we cover... Um, well, let's say 135 men, uh, uh, 15 women. You'll be amazed at some of the people. I, I know I went on and on about the, the names of people, but it's, it's quite significant. Thank you so much. Thanks. Can I, can I just welcome you to the Super. family, Marcus, as well? <laughs> Thank you so much. Hey, um, Marcus, if I can just say real quick, Tony, I'm not sure if uh, Las Vegas Evertonians is, is live. Um, maybe touch base with San Diego or even with SoCal, Sacramento, Mary over at Sacramento, or even the Arizona group. Yeah, we can, we can, we can follow up with Marcus to make sure that um, the next person he speaks to is an Evertonian. Okay. Absolutely. That's perfect. I'm probably going to be over in San Diego uh, uh, next weekend. So uh, if I don't catch up with the guys here, I'll try to track them down there. Yeah, do. Welcome aboard. Thanks.
Hi, David. Anyone? Greetings from Toronto, Canada. I Hello, David. Can you hear me okay? I can indeed, thank you. Great, no, congratulations. It's an outstanding publication. I can't wait to go through it. But it's exciting times, isn't it, for the toppies? We've got a world-class manager. We've got a world-class facility being built. And I was just wondering, what's the status of the, the new stadium? Has anybody been down there and given an update when it's going to be opened? Well, the, 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 uh, thanks for the question. The stadium has received planning permission. And I think they're, they're planning to make break ground later this year. But it's going to be a challenging project. A very ambitious project. You know, they're going to have to fill in a dock and then erect a stadium around it. And, and of course, when it comes to transportation, unless they bring stuff in via the Mersey, they're going to have to bring it all down the dock road. So it's going to be, a, um, I, I think my concern would be uh, they're going to spend uh, half a billion pounds building the stadium. But my fear is the overruns associated with something as ambitious as, as this. We're redeveloping Goodison Park. That's not a possibility. Oh no, this is they, they've made the commitment to it. That they, they, they've got a team together now. They, I think they've already got the contractor involved. Obviously, the design work's been done by Dan Mice, who's an American. And, uh, and I think it's been improved or refined by some English company. It's, it's, they're fully committed to it now. The, the stadium, I think, having gone through the permitting process, the stadium is going to be built. The funds uh, have been secured, I understand. And, uh, you know, it's, it, and we, we're told that it's not going to impact on the money available to the world-class manager to bring in, hopefully, world-class players. That's great. Just maybe just to, to, to build on that as well, just to add to what David said there, Dick, is, is there is also an ambitious project to ensure that there's a development um, at the Goodison Park site as well. Um, so there's a big project there to invest in quite a far reaching community facility. Uh, which the club has committed to as well. So there'll be some reinvestment going back into that local community, obviously, once, uh, you know, once the ground moves. No, that's, that's great. I was very impressed with what you were telling me, you know, all of us, about uh, the facilities, not just the facilities, but the groups that are working in the community, Revan Football Club. Because the reason, I don't know if you mind when, why you were supporting Everton, I said I fell into the River Mersey. I came out blue rather than red. So I have a long lifetime over to Evertonian. You mentioned about Everton Sheffield United today. I've got an Everton Sheffield United program here, Saturday 9th of April 1966. Wow. Another bit of history. A little bit of history, but uh, no, I, I always enjoy going with my grandma, grandfather to the Goodison Park facility in the 60s to watch the heroes and Dave Hickson the cannonball kid used to stop off at the gas station on his way into the ground on match days and he got the relationship with a friend of mine and my uncle and eventually down the road when he's retired and he was playing for Elsmith for Town Football Club I was a student at Chester College and playing for Chester Cheshire County League and we played against uh, Dave Hickson and uh, Ellen Ford Town. And we beat them one nothing. So, uh, <laughs> but uh, no, it's always had that uh, community feel to me, not the commercial aspects. And as I say, very impressed with what you were mentioning there, Tony. And the book, geez, how many pages, David? How many pages? It's uh, 568. Jeez. Uh, it's a lot of words, and some of them are in the right order. Great. No, congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. Super. I just wanted to make a comment to our new family member, Marcus, as well. I think it's important that one of the things that you heard that, that many other teams, they, they, they outgrow their stadium. They, they can't update their stadium anymore. We have one of the oldest. And, uh, and they leave it, and they build a new one, because progress is progress. But... 
Everton didn't do that. And not only did they literally canvas fans around the world on our opinions about a new stadium, part of that was what we would do with the old stadium. And the whole way through, it's been the deal that if we build a new stadium, what are we going to do with one of the poorest areas in Liverpool when we leave it behind? And I, I, that for me, that's something I'm really, really proud of, even to the point of them working in like park design. So part of the, the pitch is still there and, and just really honoring our history because it is a part of us, very much so. Thank you for that. Any other comments uh, or, or questions uh, out there? I, I have one if, if there's not another one, but I see David Kilpatrick with a hand. Yes, David. Hello, everyone. Thank you both. Uh, congratulations, David, on a fantastic uh, achievement with the book. And uh, as the former president of Arsenal America, uh, congratulations, Tony, on the, on the growth of Everton's uh, groups here in, in North America. I just wanted to, uh, first of all, uh, an email I received from Chloe. Uh, many of you on the call, I'm not sure if all, but many know uh, of the National Soccer Hall of Famer, Clive Toy. He sent me this email about today's session, so I'll just read this. Quote, I hope the Everton folk realize that history would be an astounding amount different in Everton if Everton was not playing in Bill Cox's ISL in 61. The Express sent me over to cover a number of things, including Everton and Kilmarnock, playing in Cox's tournament. I met him. He said he was going to start a league. I wrote a story. Phil Wisdom re read it and became intrigued. And on and on and on, Phil and I ended up running the league and other things. No Cox, no league, no Everton. Many question marks. So uh, thank you, Everton, for coming over and participating in the ISL in 61, had it not been for that. There may never have been a North American Soccer League. There may never have been a New York Cosmos. Uh, the, the causal analysis could go on and on and on. Um, but I do have a question of my own. Um, David, you mentioned something about um, Everton training in Central Park. I wonder if there's any photos of that. I haven't read all of the book yet. So if it's in the book, I apologize. Uh, I think I've read the first chapter, first two chapters. Um, I wonder if you could elaborate a little bit more on that and any frustrations with the infrastructure at the time. Obviously, by the time they're getting to Houston, things are a great deal different. But uh, I've been to the museum uh, at Hearts at Edinburgh, and the ISL plays a really prominent role in, in their museum. Um, so I'm just wondering what the legacy of the ISL um, is uh, for Evertonians. And one follow-up question, Maybe Tony could answer this, uh, David or Tony. Um, I guess it was five, six years ago, um, Everton invested in FC Wester um, with the Dortmund Academy. I don't believe they're still involved there. I wonder if either of you know the status of that or any lessons that may have been learned from that project. Thank you. Can I start with uh, Clive? We interviewed Clive uh, for the book. So his uh, comments on the, both the International Soccer League or his members of the International Soccer League and also the formation of the NASL are well documented in there. And he was a delightful guy to talk to, uh, sorry, to listen to. He was a wonderful guy. <clears throat> when it comes to the International Soccer League, uh, Everton, uh, when they arrived in New York City, they were put up in what we would call a DOS house. Um, in uh, which was opposite to uh, Central Park, where they planned to train. Uh, it was a place where people of ill repute frequented it, and uh, immediately the manager moved them to uh, a place, a hotel down in um, Broadway. Um, I'm sorry to hear that. I, I, I thought you were going to ask for, I thought you were going to be thanking us, but okay. Well, I, you're, I'll get to that part. And then... Um, which meant that, uh, you know, at the time Everton were, um, uh, let, let's say, unaware of how to do things in, in America, in North America. And uh, therefore, to get to training, they would take the subway. So you can just imagine that there are 16 guys all kitted out in the blue and white with the, with the boots on, 
getting into the subway system and getting out at Central Park. When they got to Central Park, there were no goalposts. Obviously, it was a baseball field, uh, but they secured the the services of a, a local by the name, an African-American local by the name of Hank. And I know this story so well that uh, I hope you don't mind me telling it to you. Well, he looked after them. He, um, he looked, made sure that, the, you know, they used the, the jerseys for goalposts, you know, in, in, in the old saying. And uh, he made sure nothing was stolen. He'd bring buckets of ice water for them to cool them down. And he generally looked after them. They, they were there for a couple of weeks. At the end of that time, a good friend of mine who was the train, who was the coach of everything at the time, he um, when they were leaving, he gave Hank a gratuity, which was twenty dollars. He gave Hank the gratuity. When he told Mr. John Moores, who was the richest man in the country, that what he'd done, Mr. Moores told him to go and get it back. Um, that that was being too generous. So. Uh, my good friend went to Hank and he asked him if he could refund it. And he said he'll be glad to do so. And Hank approached Mr. Moores with his big coffee can full of dimes and quarters and emptied them at his feet. And unbelievably, Manhattan came to a standstill as John Moores bent down and picked them all up. And, and I guess that's why you become a multimillionaire or a billionaire. Uh, the, 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 the conditions in, um, I think, were, were shocking for, for a professional uh, organisation. But I'm glad we took part in it. I, I really am. And I have one question for you, David. When are you going to take Alex Iwobi back? Never. Oh, you, you, know, you know how I feel about him. I almost got thrown out of Wembley about him. That's another story for another day. Oh, dear. I mean, Theo Walcott was one thing, but, you know, Alex Awobi is, is, is uh, pushing it, my friend. We can ask I, was those at the League Cup, I was at the League Cup final at Wembley, and unfortunately I was at the center line sitting amongst Man City fans. And uh, when Awobi came on, I blurted out, what on hell is he putting him on for? Suddenly the security almost threw me right out of Wembley. So Awobi, Awobi has a... A special dark place in my heart. Yeah, no. <laughs> good to, it's good to know you're not alone. It's good to know you're not alone. Hey, David, just a quick on your question as well on um, on the uh, the connections with the club. I didn't actually quite catch the name, but first of all, it'd be good to connect with you separately. Actually, I'd love to listen to you and and, and get your learnings with um, with Arsenal America. So maybe we could we could connect outside. The club is is now embarking on a, an international affiliate sort of academy program. So it's got a number of uh, partnerships already in place. I think there's one in Columbus. Uh, there's another one in Miami. Uh, and it's looking to expand that um, sort of over the years. That's part of this sort of six pillar international strategy. So I'm expecting there to be more sort of hookups with clubs from a grassroots level, but also to a higher standard as well. So, um, but I didn't catch the name of the club that you mentioned, but I don't think that it's in, it, 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 there's much going on with it at the moment. Yeah, that, that's, that was FC West, Westchester, FC yeah. Westchester, New York. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Uh, can I just put things in, into perspective here regarding Everton's role in North America in the future? I, I think... Um, Dick had mentioned in the book that Everton have got some catching up to do. And uh, to be realistic, we, we had, you know, the, the, the most, maybe the, the greatest US born football player in Landon Donovan and the, the face and the beard of US soccer in Tim Howard. And we didn't exploit it. You know, those years ago when they played, we failed to exploit that. Also, that's typical of us is that we had Lai Tia, who is who plays for China and is now the manager of China. And we failed to exploit that in China as well. But we're playing catch up. I think it would be unreasonable to think that we're going to compete with Real Madrid and Manchester United and Liverpool in um, penetrating the North American market. But what we can do is create a special niche for ourselves um, where maybe we, we recreate what Everton is in the United Kingdom and we recreate that in, in, in quality rather than in quantity.
Wonderful. Uh, any last parting shots? Um, I have one thing that I can hopefully share, um, but I don't know if I'm going to be able to pull it off. Ah, it, uh, I, I'm trying to uh, get a photograph of a young David Moyes up onto my screen from in front of the Scots American Club in Kearney, New Jersey. He was a youth player, I believe, for uh, Celtic Boys. And he had come over to America to play in uh, you know, a summer exhibition. Uh, I can share that uh, with you. I found it uh, at a gentleman's house who was uh, you know, coaching uh, Thistle uh, Football Club in Kearney. And, and there is, is uh, uh, a young David Moyes, full head of you know, curly uh, red hair, uh, perhaps in his first trip over uh, to the United States. Uh, I, I'm not sure. But I wanted to thank uh, everyone uh, involved in today's program. Uh, Patrick Sullivan for helping organize it, uh, one of the society board members. Uh, of course, uh, the folks at Duke Coubertin Publishing who uh, introduced us uh, to the project and to David. And then David uh, gave us a, a link to Tony and it all came together in, in about a week or so. So uh, I, I wanna thank you for joining us. I think we've left enough time for Tony uh, to get out of the house and, uh, and, and to the uh, uh, watch party uh, to watch uh, his beloved Everton uh, play uh, Sheffield United today. And uh, happy to see that, uh, that Mark has, uh, uh, you know, joined the bandwagon uh, and, and may he get uh, 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 to the People's Club at some point. Uh, but thank you very much. Uh, this was a thrill for, for us. And uh, as, as we go forward, I, I think it's also a model for, for other programs uh, with other clubs that have a presence in, in, in North America, maybe not as deep uh, and wide as a history as Everton Football Club, but still a relationship between um, you know, England and the United States. Um, so thank you for joining us. Um, all the best with your efforts and, and good luck in the match today. Thank you. Thank Thanks. you, David. Thank you, Tony. Cheers, guys.